Welcome to The Problem, a Lockwood & Co. podcast. I'm Caitlin. I'm Alan. And this week we are talking about part two of part four, chapters 18 and 19. Right. And it's only two chapters, so obviously we're going to be under an hour this time. So easy. Yep. I was literally like... My brain over and over was like, don't say I'm Caitlin. Don't say I'm... I was like, why? Why are you... That's not a problem. Yeah, I was going to say that's never come up before. I know. My brain was sure it was going to happen. The one mistake we've never made is calling ourselves somebody else's name. (laughs) I'm just looking at it in the script like I need to read my name. No, I don't. I don't need that. I I read it every time, even though I say exactly the same thing every time. Yeah. I'd probably panic if I wasn't reading. All right. Do we want to jump right in, I guess? I guess. In Chapter 18, Lockwood and Co. explore the Bickerstaff Manor, find a hidden room, and confirm the bone glass was created there. And the chapter art is the falling apart staircase. It looks dangerous. It does, and but I, I appreciate what they did in the picture. Because very quickly on in the text, they describe the staircase as having like fungus growing up it which i assume is like mushroomy type things um and that in mushrooms growing in an indoor context i find to be one of the grossest things in the whole world (laughs) like i don't like it i hate it as soon as he was describing that i was like oh it makes it super creepy i hate it the staircase seems like the most dangerous thing in the house to me I don't like anything about it. I find a lot in this chapter to be really quite scary. The this, next, it's well, the worst. Yeah, this chap, these two chapters are the worst. Well, the second one, I find Kips and stuff is there. Kips and stuff, you know what I'm saying. Um, right. And so it's less scary and more just like fuck these assholes. <laughs> um, but this first chapter, no, thank you. Well, I think this is like the scariest stuff in this book. When we left off last time, we were all like, I'm an agent, et cetera, et cetera. You know the deal. Going into the house and then they come in and it's mushrooms and rats and it's bad. But to start off things, it's I, quiet. I will least. just a quick correction. It it is very particularly not rats just yet. Not That's yet. important. It's so I'm so scared of rats in real life. This is why this is so scary to me. Oh, I like to say I'm not, but like, like, like I don't think about rats the way, you know, when you sometimes other things that I have a phobia of, I can just think of them and be like, oh, rats don't do that to me. But as soon as I see one, I'm like, no, 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 no. I think it's because when I was a kid, so many times, like we would move once a year when I was a kid. So many times when we would move, I would not have a bed. Uh, so I would sleep on the floor and very often we would live somewhere that had mice or rats. And, and so I would be sleeping on the floor and wake up to something crawling over me. And so like, I just can't handle the thought of it. It makes me feel out of control and like, it just triggers me. Yes. And so, that's very fair. Yeah. It's just like, it makes me crazy to think about. He does a great job of like the scuttling and I'm like, ah, no. Something sort of similar happened to me once, but I was incredibly drunk and it was actually just a cat. Uh, (laughs) But I still was so drunk that I really scared the shit out of myself and refused to go back to sleep where I was. It's real in your mind. That's what matters. And then I, so I moved to a different part of the, uh, I was in my friend's house and like I had been given, she was redoing a room in the basement and there was a couch in there and that's where I was sleeping. And I was just like, nope. So I moved myself up to the living room where somebody else was asleep on the couch. We'd had a rough night. Well, we'd had a fun <laughs> night, but we were in the rough part of it. And right. so I was just like, I'm taking the floor because I could not go back to that room in the basement. And then my friend who was on the couch woke up in the morning and was like, what What the hell are you doing down there? <laughs> <laughs> See, we had like our little patter section anyway, so. Yes. It all worked out. Um, so then as they go in, uh, they have a bit where, you know, Lucy is listening for things. Lockwood is looking for things. He does not find any dead clothes. Lucy doesn't find anything. And then George does his job of taking all the readings. And he says it is 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, well, in the in the North American edition, um, which I don't 
I don't know off the top of my head what that is in Celsius, but I know it's not that hot. And I would like to remind everyone that this is like the hot London summer. Yeah, that I had the exact same thought. I was like, maybe we're just so used to global warming. I don't know. That, yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Maybe this is like supposed to be without global warming. Why oh, not? yeah. OK. OK. Because I know nowadays London does have bad heat waves where it doesn't cool off at night and that sort of thing. But I do believe at least so I wrote, the weather here in Vancouver is very similar to the weather in London, kind of rainy and temperate 10 years ago or more. We would maybe have a week of like unbearable heat and then that was it. Everything else was fine. No more. That doesn't happen anymore. Now it's like fire and death. Right. Right. Yeah. And brimstone. <laughs> and only a little bit of that was an exaggeration. So, yeah, this seems more in line with like my childhood memories of a summer night and maybe uh, Stroud's memories, too. Um, yeah. Yeah, it seems too mild to me, but yeah, maybe the problem has had the unintended positive effect of like slowing down industrialized global oh, yeah. warming. That's 15 degrees Celsius, 15, 16 ish. I would love that on a summer night that I could sleep in 15 degrees. Yeah, when they say it in the audiobook, I'm like, oh, that's like the heart of winter, but that's not what that means. Because I live in America, so I don't know. Fifteen. So you were thinking fifteen like, Fahrenheit, yeah. Yeah, fifteen. You weren't is thinking like fifteen Celsius cold. was the heart of winter. Yeah. Although here it kind of is. It's probably going to be ten today, which is wild for January. Yeah, global warming. So then they have a moment where I think it's Lockwood is sort of making a plan, and he says, "We don't bring up the skull unless Lucy says so," and then Lucy yeah. says, "That's right," and I'm like, "Oh yeah, now now they offer her some choice in the matter." <laughs> but they brought Skull along without telling her. Yeah. We'll conspire behind your back, but then give you agency. Yes, exactly. Um, And right after that, okay, here we begin my confusion with the door opening rule. Because they go around opening all these doors into different rooms. And I'm like, are they taking turns? Is Lucy opening every door? You know, is she up for this whole job? What are they... What, what's happening with the door opening rule? This is an important rule. It's it, second only to the biscuit rule. Exactly. So what is happening here? Yeah, I'd like to have a running tally of how many times a rule is second only to the biscuit rule because it, <laughs> it does happen other times. I don't actually think this rule comes up again after this book. I could no, be wrong. No, I don't think so. Uh, so I am definitely looking too much into it. But also... On Lucy's behalf, I feel that this is very unfair. And especially in a group of friends, I am very fairness minded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm upset that she has to do two big doors in a row. It's she should get extra biscuits. <laughs> yeah. The thing that bothered me when they're walking around, it talks about how there's no light fixtures anywhere and there's ragged holes where they were torn away mm -hmm. but then later it talks about how the whole house is equipped for gaslighting and i was like that seems dangerous that there are just like the places where the fixtures should be is just open gas piping or is i hope the gas is off i'm sure the gas is off yeah although uh i mean not to share too much about where i work <laughs> but let's just say that one night we got a call about somebody walking down the street who could smell gas and it turned out that in a like abandoned boarded up house somebody some like thieves had gone in and stolen all the copper piping mm. and so because it was boarded up it was just filling with gas and we had Great. to evacuate like blocks of people so that we could air it it was a disaster Jesus. nobody got hurt it was fine and it was just like somebody out for an evening stroll who called us <laughs> And oh, was God. like, mm, maybe we smell gas. And uh, yeah. Anyway, so if you're going to steal copper piping, turn off the gas. <laughs> like, bring <laughs> a sea wrench and turn off the meter. Could have gone poorly for them, too, you know? Like, God. Yeah. So we've given people tips for how to hide a body and now uh, <laughs> how to how steal to... copper piping. Yeah. Good. Do you know, crime, there's... but be smart about it. Right. It's value in your podcast is really what it's all about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Anyways, we have a quick moment where they think there's a rat, but actually it's a mouse. And it's like a real mouse. Yes, yes, not a ghost. It's still scary. This is my first note. It says, yeah, only a mouse. I breathed a tiny one. I thought George exhaled loudly. Me too. I thought it was bigger. I thought it was a rat. And my note is, no, it's a demon. <coughs> this, this is a literal demon. So, Mice can be cute, but I will uh-huh. say only if you want them there. You know, if they if you see them in a room when you don't want there to be one, then it's just like, ooh. So, d- yeah, despite my phobia, my children have had pet mice and and hamsters and stuff. It freaks me out. I can't even touch them or feed them or pet them. Yeah. I, I can't handle it. Do you have problems saying no to your children? No, no. I I try to... I think part of being a good parent is understanding that like what triggers you and and what is wrong with you has nothing to do with them and you have to like make choices based on that and not based on like making yourself comfortable making yourself comfortable is the definition of being a bad parent in my opinion i i see what you're saying but also maybe maybe your kids don't want to have something in the house that triggers your phobia so bad because they like you oh no they think it's hilarious so awesome they're like look at how dad screams like a girl ha, 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 ha. so it's good okay that is also a different point of view that i should have thought of <laughs> you're right so then they find the secret door do they is that what or are they just looking around yeah because because they shine the light on this thing uh, and there's also no furniture in the house. It reveals the outline of a secret door. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That happens. But also, just before they open the secret door, or just before Lucy opens the secret door, they have a moment where they notice that George is acting a little strange. And so Lockwood and Lucy sort of agree to keep an eye on him. And yeah. they adjust how they're walking so that he's between them. And I just really like that. that because the show kind of made... It made this whole arc seem like they were both unintentionally leaving George out. Yeah. And I like that we have this little moment here where they're like, we got to keep an eye on George. I made a note of this too. And my note was family. Like yeah. this feels like a very strong. Yeah. Like they have each other's backs. And even in the show, I think there's that thing that Lucy says in the last episode. She's like, we were too caught up in our own bullshit. Um, yeah. Uh, so then Lucy does open the door, which, as I've said before, I am upset about on her behalf, but nobody else <laughs> seems worried about it. The rule has already gone out the window, even though it was just very important. She opens the door and she walks in and she doesn't get anything right away. This is terrifying. And then she feels like someone's behind her. Yeah. And she hears the cough and she realizes that Lockwood and George are not in the room with her and the door is shut behind her. And this is my one note i just i put a post it in the middle of the page and just wrote down this is terrifying oh yeah it's it's really bad it talks about like the darkness swallows her and yeah and that one cough in the like oh yeah no 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 so then she uh does something very smart and she immediately gets the fuck out <laughs> she's just like nope um and finds the others and it's like what are you doing out here and they're like what were you doing in there <laughs> yeah we were following these sounds didn't you hear these sounds and she's like there were no sounds i was alone in a dark room these two chapters i think are so so scary because stuff like this yeah how the house is like able to divide them so easily yeah when when she first noticed that she was alone, I was ready to be pissed at Lockwood and George because I thought that, you know, sometimes they, you know, have little little fun jokes, as it were. Right. Yeah. And like, I was like, did they do this on purpose, those assholes? And, but then everybody was just confused. And I was like, I guess I can forgive them. That's fine. No, this is just the house yeah. being really smart. But they heard like rat like noises, right? The, yeah, exactly. Scurrying noises is what they say, like rats. Uh, but then they decide to go back in, and Lucy says, no one get distracted this time. Yeah, and they, they say, I think Lockwood says they didn't notice her go in at all. 
Uh, so somehow like that was hidden from them supernaturally. So it's just really all around. It's just pretty scary. But they do go back in and they don't notice any psychic stuff at all in the room initially. Yeah, no psychic stuff. But there is like that creepy dissection table. And there's also sprouts projecting all over the floor. <sighs> no, thank you. There's this moment here that I think is interesting and again comes back to like how Lockwood is uses work to like detach himself from his trauma. He's like kind of admiring the table in a sense. It, it talks about like he runs his finger along the groove, nice little channels he said for the flow of blood. Uh, this is a dissection table mid 19th century. I've seen examples in the Royal College of Surgeons. And so like it's like an artifact to him and he laments how it's made out of iron and therefore right Lucy can't pick up signals from it. I bet Lucy was like oh thank goodness. Yeah, thank god. <laughs> um and then she walks over to where a fireplace is or used to be and sort of starts touching the mantle cuz she assumes that you know somebody was over there hanging out and just leaning on the mantle or something like that and it was as far away from the iron table as she could get in the room yep. and she has this moment where she says something like you can try the same spot five times and get nothing and then on the sixth you're knocked off your feet with the power of the psychic recall and i thought that was super interesting because i feel like every other time we've seen her do it if she doesn't get something she doesn't try again what she seems to be saying to me is that there's a little bit of agency to the object. It's just not super scientifically reliable. It's not up to the psychic detector of the person. There seems to be like a relationship. Or, and hear me out, maybe this is just bad writing because I don't think it comes up <laughs> ever again. And I don't think it's ever come up before. Like, what if she was in her job interview, you know, where Lockwood is all here, touch these objects, and they decided to not give her anything for five times? Yeah. Or yeah, whatever, yeah. you know, like it. I agree that, yeah, this doesn't jive with the world building that we've got or with Lucy as a character, yeah, a, as a psychic. But I do like how it does jive with the way that, like, psychics are supposed to operate in the real world that it's it's a very mushy unscientific non-repeatable thing yeah i would nature. like this if it yeah. ever came up again yeah or, yeah, yeah or previously i think you're right to point it out and then right after that we get the agent swipes tm thing the what now oh yes again it's a nice little commercialization of the whole ghost hunting thing so she was about to reach into her bag for her trademarked agent's wipes. And then you get like a what their slogan must be ideal for removing soot, grave dirt and ectoplasm stains. But then she happens to brush against the door and it triggers a, a psychic event for her. And she sees like a whole group of men stood around the dissection table and they're uh they're talking and laughing and she can smell tobacco she hears a voice that is telling all of them what to do probably bigger staff yeah my only note here is that it's very terrifying the way it's all set up the, re only, the really only important thing we get is the where they say try wilberforce he'll do it he's eager and we've heard that name before in george's research and stuff we know that he is one of the two people, Mary Dulac and Wilberforce, who was killed by or, the research. Or went missing or... Went missing, yeah. yeah. Um, and then when Lucy sort of comes out, oh, and then a whole lot of voices sort of scream, give us back our bones at Lucy. Um, and then when she comes out of it, she, the way that she describes what she heard with the, the, the flies rising right. is very similar to what she heard when with the bone glass and so then through that she figures this is where they created the bone glass in this room but they still don't know why or what it does uh and then they hear some creeping noises yeah there's a good moment where she says like 
maybe or so George is like the voice you heard was it Bickerstaff and she's like maybe but actually I thought it sounded more like and it's never good when one of us breaks off halfway through a sentence like that it's always bad news generally speaking it means something's happened or is very much about to happen and we have to stop talking or die right right yeah <laughs> so she heard something that made her stop talking uh to me when she's halfway through the sentence this is this is skull right yeah that's what i get too that she was going to say it sounded like skull but everybody did hear something creeping up the passage and getting closer lockwood says to turn down the lights which seems weird to me if we're like a ghost is coming up on us wouldn't you want more light to make them weaker but i don't know i don't want to question lockwood's competence because he's like the dashing hero but like it seems weird to me <laughs> maybe he does think it sounds more like people yeah but i you're right though because the ghosts wouldn't need to would ghosts need to hear or see them in order to find them or would ghosts just know that they're there yeah i don't know i don't know i don't know that we ever get an answer on that but they take up positions to attack whatever comes through the door Anyways, chapter 19. The Kip's team reveal themselves. Skull reveals the hidden papers. And Wilberforce's ghost reveals that it is 1,000 rats in a trench coat. I have so many questions about Wilberforce's ghost, but we'll get there in a minute. Um, the chapter art is the loose floorboard that they find the papers under. Um, yeah, so then it turns out that the noise is Kips and his team, and they walk in and both Kips and Lockward like almost stab each other and then try to convince each other that they were the one who was going to kill the other. It's very grandstandy. Oh, yeah, it's it's a big pissing contest. I'm still parsing through the revelation of what the picture was because I was like, I don't know what this picture is. Oh, but you were easily <laughs> like, this is obviously what it is. And I was like, you're right. That is what it is. Yeah, they're like a fun puzzle that we get every week. Um. So, okay, so just previously we were talking about when Lockwood said to turn the lights down. The The language says to turn, he, he turned the lantern down. But now Cat Godwin here is holding a night lantern, which apparently is different than their lantern. And what, what is a night lantern? I don't know. Why aren't most lanterns for night? <laughs> right. I, I, why, why didn't their lantern get this, get this prefix? prefix of of night what and it, it comes blue? He, he uses it more than one time he says it's a night lantern i'm like what what is that why mm -hmm. is it different it, this bothers me a lot if any agency would have special lanterns it would be the fitz agency right because that's like their great thing. then call it a fitz lantern or something yeah. but why is it called like it's a lowercase n too so it's not a name mm -hmm. it's a it, like it's, it's a thing. Yeah, it's a style of lantern. But I feel, I just feel in my soul that all lanterns are for nighttime. You know, like what you don't need the the sun is out during the day. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Is there a different? Is there like a tunnel lantern? Is that what? This is the <laughs> most know. insignificant thing. It doesn't matter at all, but it bothers me so much. I'm googling it just to see if it's a thing. But everything that I come up with for night lanterns is just like. The kind of paper lanterns that float up into the sky kind of thing. And that is oh. not what she has. Yeah. That would be hilarious, though. If she <laughs> just walked in be with amazing. a paper lantern. <laughs> you're like, stop launching lanterns in this room, Cat God, yeah. when you're going to burn us to Oh, death. my God. I would like Cat so much better if she was just a fucking weirdo like that. <laughs> who was just setting off paper lanterns wherever they went you're not disney rapunzel please stop it we're just like she and lucy to... get along so much better because of their their fire <laughs> <laughs> yeah she's just a little pyro anyways let's move on i'll try to put it out of my head yeah that's never bothered me but i think you're totally right the yeah so all of their opposite number kind of pour into the room and there's a confrontation Lockwood is is able to restrain himself from murder because of his incredible reflexes and so is Kips. I enjoy this idea because the sorry, the Kips team, Kips's team is four people and yeah. Lockwood's team is three people, obviously. So like it's their opposites plus Ned. 
which to me at any rate implies that Ned is the opposite of um uh what's her face from book three? Oh, Holly. Holly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But but Ned dies in book three, obviously. So they just they just <laughs> never get to meet. You know, they never get to have their confrontation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I assume that Ned is like when you take Ned and Kips and put them together, you get Lockwood. You mean Lockwood's opposite, not right? Yeah, yeah Lockwood takes two people. Don't tell him that. Jeez. Right. Yeah. He's he is like you know Kips is uh, the leader of the team and Lockwood is the leader. But Lockwood is also like the warrior of the team. And so that's like what Ned is. I guess that that's actually fair because Kips is kind of half an agent since he can no longer see ghosts. Yeah. If that. Yeah. You know, he's not even half he's just the fighter there. Lockwood is. Yeah. yeah. Um, so w- once they're sort of questioning what Kips is doing there, they do say that they they didn't follow them and that Bobby Vernon's, sorry, little Bobby Vernon's uh, research <laughs> led them there. And do we think that that is true? Oh, I never questioned this because of the kind of reader that I am. But mm. I think it's fair to question it. Yeah. Because we see, like, after this, they do just sort of follow them around. They stop doing their own thing uh-huh. because they realize that Lockwood and Co. no more. I think it's totally possible that they stumbled on similar information that led them to this place. Yeah, it, well... <laughs> But I mean, it was Skull that led them here. But it oh, is like Biggerstaff's manner, so it makes yeah, sense to I check mean. it out. So yeah. I don't know. I, I feel like it could be either. Yeah, you're right, though, that they have the inside track because of Skull. Um, the other thing that I kept thinking about here, and this is extra textual, so it can't answer your question at all. But during the cluster con thing, Stroud revealed that in the original draft for the screaming staircase, when they were in Coombe Carey Hall, they, he was going, he wrote a version of it, the original version of it where Kips and his team are in there. And this kind of thing happens almost exactly. Oh, but in Coombe Carey Hall and he didn't like it. It didn't work, but it was like his original idea was to have Kips in there and it messes everything up for them and they have to deal with with all of that. And he was like, eh, this doesn't belong. But he kept the idea in his back pocket and he was like, this, in this book, I'm going to have this haunted house thing where they're coming across each other and the problem is, you know, how they don't get along and it makes everything much, much worse. Yeah. I do love um, that... Lucy is the one who, okay, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. First of all, George has the most savage uh, cutting line here where he says, uh, like, that's assuming Kips can actually read and write. And then, I don't know, Ned Shaw says something and then George is like, right, let me rephrase. I'll bet there are apes in the Borneo rainforest with a better grasp of literacy than him. (laughs) Just great. Wonderful, George. Um, anyways, eventually, when everybody's yelling at each other, Lucy's the one who, like, steps in and is like, what are you doing? We're in a haunted house. It's affecting you and you're affecting it. Shut up, everyone. And I just right. love this because I wrote down, oh, your time will come, Luce. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't worry. I I do like the symbolism of what's happening here, too their rage getting out of control and it you can feel like the danger is almost palpable of the negative emotions and all this stuff. But if you read the foils as like them kind of fighting themselves, Mm -hmm. it leads to like this self anger and hatred and all of that kind of traps you in the past, which is, you know, what ghosts are and it destroys your future and, those negative emotions kind of charge up in a way where you can't have a future. That's what ghosts are. That's the past holding you back. And right. Stuff, so. Interesting. I'm, I don't ever think of it that deeply. I'm just like haunted house makes people on edge. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, I like that. Well, it is that ontologically. Yeah. Like in the story. Yeah. Um, 
So then they start hearing a rustling that maybe sounds a bit like rats. So they're like, get your chains out. And <laughs> the Fitz team gets set up real quick. So then they all jump into the Fitz chains, which I do like. I do like that even though they hate each other, they don't actually want each other ghost touched. So that's nice. Yeah, and it shows that the Fitz team, they're competent and their training is really good. Yeah. They're training in controlled circumstances because there's no ghosts around right now. They're really good at following orders is what I'm saying. Yes. Um, but then I think nothing comes of it. They just hear the sounds and then the two groups agree to go their separate ways in the house and not get in each other's way. Yeah. That's the agreement anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So the Lockwood group takes off from the secret room and leaves the others to research it since they've already gotten all the information they need from it. And they interrogate Skull about where the papers are that he wants them to get. And he eventually sort of says, upstairs. <laughs> right. I don't yeah. know what that voice was, but anyways. Sorry, did you have something to say? I just like that the reason that they use Skull is because... It feels to me because the Kips team is there and now there's like pressure. Yeah, there's stakes now. They want to get in and out as quickly as possible so that the right. Kips team doesn't... Find the secret first. Find the secret first. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. otherwise they would have had time to poke Just around. figure as, it out. Yeah. I think it's important to remember because I'd kind of forgotten that in the previous chapter they had talked about how they don't expect ghosts to be here yeah. because what's-his-face died somewhere else. Yeah, because they know his source is tied to his body. Oh, yeah, because so, his source is somewhere else. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah, not died somewhere else. Yeah, they don't think there's going to be a ghost here, which obviously is stupid. Um, but they do eventually go upstairs. And on the way up, Lucy is like, look at the wainscoting. What are those dark stains running along, along it? And why would you ask? Why? <laughs> why would you? Like, there's no good answer there. Yeah. There's there's no good answer. Just come up with the worst thing and keep it to yourself. Anyways, they think it's probably from rats. Yeah, um, the answer is rats. Yeah. It is the worst thing. So, I don't have any I don't have any notes in this chapter because it's really just they go upstairs, they try to find the notes, they find the notes, and George does a poor job guarding the doorway. Yeah, I. What do you think the reason for that is? Is it, is this the mesmerism doing oh, its thing? Or I just is it thought just it was George normal fear curious. of missing out. Yeah, yeah. George wants, I, although maybe a little bit. Right. Yeah. No, because George wants the notes, and it's a little bit of you know George being the one who, who likes reading the the stuff. You know what I'm saying? He wants the notes for his own personal reasons, not just the case reasons. Yeah, this feels in character to me. Yeah. Of, he should not have been the one to be the guard when there's like notes to be read. This is true. Um, but like Lucy had to be the one to, you know, talk to skull. So she had to be there and Lockwood had to be the triumphant. I found them. He couldn't give that up. <laughs> right. Right. So, yeah, I think Lockwood should have been the guard, uh, but he, yes, he couldn't stand to be. Yeah. yeah. And then the actual like scary, Thing that happens here is another human being it feels like well before that lucy does get a flash of like of when wilberforce looked into the mirror and yeah, how that killed yeah. him and skull is is pretty scary too where he's like good girl you're getting closer that's creepy to me where he's like he's really kind of savoring it feels like he knows that oh 100 percent, he knows yeah, that, there's that somebody else died here yeah. 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 And it's that, that sort of flash of watching Wilberforce die that makes Lucy realize somebody else died here. That's that's what's happening. We're screwed. Yeah. Well, not we're screwed because they are agents, but, you know, th there this is, is the center of the problem, though, in, in the house. This yeah. is where the source is. Yeah. Lockwood gets the notes and then uh, or George enters the room to also see the notes. And so, of course, Ned Shaw comes in behind him because George wasn't paying attention to his lookout duties. Right. And I just fucking hate Ned Shaw. He's the like, worst. Like, when he, he comes in and he says, give them here. I'm like, why? Like, they found them. Why, why would they give them to you? Because he's big. Yeah. I want him. Well, 
you know, he does die. So I just have to wait. <laughs> I just have to wait. It's fine. I do constantly get Ned Shaw confused with George's opposite. Little Bobby Vernon. Bobby Vernon. Yeah. And so I'm I'm always like, why are they scared of him? He's tiny. And then I'm like, oh, no, he, it's the other one. Okay. They should they should call him Little Ned Shaw. <laughs> oh, my God. That would make him crazy. <laughs> That would be good. (laughs) Anyways, then Shaw starts a fight with Lockwood, and then Kips comes up, and Shaw says Lockwood started it. And I'm like, Kips must know Ned Shaw, right? Like, Oh, yeah. Why does does he trust him? Yeah. Well, do you think... So is this a supernatural effect on Ned Shaw to make him... Because they kind of, like, blow him off. They're like, whatever, dude. We're going to leave. And then he, like, loses his temper and takes a cheap shot at Lockwood and this seems wild to me to try to commit murder in a haunted house but is it the house affecting Ned I don't like to give him that much credit because we saw him be a really big jerk to the kids during the day uh previously and that was to much younger kids right and he was like being a violent bully so I I honestly I don't put this past like I do think because in book three, Stroud writes Ned's death as something, maybe not the readers, but like that the people in world care about. I do think he, it has to be a little bit of the house forcing him to do this. Because even Kips wouldn't have a murderer for a friend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I suppose it probably is the house. But I do think that he is just like a violent bully that I don't give two shits about. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, later we get this whole thing about like Lucy has a part of her mind that's telling her to like calm down, stop. But she can't stop herself from like, you know, indulging in the fight. Yeah. Um. So it, it seems like the house is definitely like feeding their negative emotions, but it's not hard to push Ned Shaw. Yeah. There, there was a thing here too about where she's hearing the voices of Bickerstaff and stuff. Mm -hmm. And we get a repetition of him saying like, you should be honored to do this. And uh, it's your heart desire to look into the, yes, into the mirror. And, and it doesn't seem like it's his heart desire at all. It seems like what Bickerstaff wants. I do like that switch up because it doesn't say it will show you your heart's desire. It says the actual looking is your heart's desire. Is your heart's desire, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so it seems like that's what Bickerstaff's heart's desire is. And then now the the whole thing of it's your heart's desire has become like part of its mantra or something. Yeah. It's kind of like how the one ring is like precious to different people. Like that's the common thread that you get with it over and over with different people Mm -hmm. yes the mirror is very one ring coded yeah yeah i like that about it though yeah Um. but then eventually with the fighting and stuff the ghost of wilberforce does appear yeah very creepy silhouette he's kind of twitching and moving around in weird ways he is dressed in victorian clothes which is automatically creepy Mm -hmm. and then he bursts into rats that's terrible. It's, it's the worst. It's not good, definitely. Now, I have a question or a thought or whatever. So we think the history is that Bickerstaff was discovered in the house having been eaten by rats, and that was how he died. Mm-hmm. But now there's this ghost that is not Bickerstaff. Like, we know that wasn't Bickerstaff. Bickerstaff was shot. Right. So we have this other ghost here who turns into rats. Do we think he was eaten by rats after he died? Because it was the mirror that killed him. Or do we think that somehow, because of all the shit that was going down in this house, that the people could hear the rats, the ghost rats, pre-problem? Right, yeah. And, and like, because it was pre-problem, it wasn't strong enough to come out and, like, ghost touch everyone. But they could, they knew that, and and in that case, like, was there ever real rats, I suppose, is what I'm saying? Or was it always just this rat ghost? Haunted rats, yeah. My reading on that, or like my 
idea of what happened was that he Wilberforce experiences some kind of ghost lock Mm -hmm. with the thing with the looking into the bone glass. I don't know if he died or if he like got into like some kind of ghost lock coma thing and then rats ate him alive. And then that's where like his rat ghost thing comes from. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that that's right. I don't know why there would be rats if there weren't rats involved. That's what I feel too. So it must so it must have been this Wilberforce dude who was eaten by rats. Yeah. And they just got him mixed up with Bickerstaff. And then they said, yeah, that it was Bickerstaff. Whether on <laughs> because, purpose or to hide everything that was going on, I don't know, but Right. Yeah. Because like no one was looking for Wilberforce, I guess. Nobody cared about him. That's a it's a weird thing. There's also no body here. Well, there's no body that we see. Yeah, that the source is tied to. So like, yeah, so is it is the source tied to the like the rats eat the body and then the rats died and then it's like they're the source? So, oh, interesting. Maybe. You know what I mean? There's rat bones around. Yeah, rat bones are the source. It could be anything really. But because Wilberforce was just declared missing and nobody ever found him, his bones still could be there. We just don't see them. Right. Right. Because yeah, they don't true. they don't bother trying to find the source. They're just like, let's get the fuck out. Um And they could be in the fireplace for all it, we know. Yeah, we they could or whatever. Or there could be another secret room or yeah, yeah, they yeah. could also be in the floorboards and Locke would just yep. grab the notes and left. Because um what's his face? Actual bigger Seth would have still been alive, so could have hit his body. Yep. Or maybe that's what happened. They hit his body somewhere and then rats ate them, ate him in the walls. Gross. Mm-hmm. Oh, that would smell terrible though. You wouldn't want that. I don't know. <laughs> it's a terrifying concept for the ghost to like turn into rats. I'm not totally sure what this type of ghost is either. Is it a changer? It's gotta be, doesn't it? Yeah, it seems to be a changer to me. The way that the rats move is like really cool. Um, where they can like run on the walls and run on the ceiling and stuff. The thing that they did in the show was like pretty scary and creepy. This would have like been a hundred times worse. The show changed this whole scene, obviously. It's it's extremely different, but they get the notes, so whatever. It's fine. Yeah, I'm not complaining about it. Yeah. I do I feel like a couple of hazy specters is probably cheaper than a thousand rats. And they have that super effective sound effect of them breathing yeah. in a weird way and like slowly dying and stuff. Yeah. It's very scary. This is terrifying to me to have rats coming from every direction. Plus, they have to like cooperate with their enemies. Uh, Lockwood is very gallant and like saves his enemies and like, you know, is like taking up the rear to keep the ghosts at bay while everybody gets down the rickety steps and out the yeah. door. And I, I love that Kips is just gone. <laughs> yeah, immediately. Yeah. Like, Kips was like, good luck. Yep. <laughs> I mean, he he can't see the ghost, so that's fair, but... It is, but it's, it's funny. He, yeah. <laughs> but they do all eventually make it out of the house, and everybody is panting from running, although Lucy does make a point to say Lockwood was hardly out of breath. So mm-hmm. I think that's funny. The hero. Yeah. Yeah. She also hears Skull laughing at yeah. all of them once they get out. Yeah, I wrote my last note is good old Skull. <laughs> Which lets us know that <clears throat> he knew that this yeah. would happen and that yeah. he is enjoying all of it. Skull's been bored for a really long time, so makes sense mm-hmm. that he would want to have some entertainment by putting people's lives in danger. I think it, it shows, too, that she was right to not trust him. Well, it's kind of like they found the notes that that was real, mm-hmm. right? But then also they could have died. So, yeah, the dichotomy of skull. And it's also like to be back on my symbolism bullshit. There's that whole thing about him being kind of the dark voice inside of her. Mm-hmm. And she really can't trust that yet because she, like she's constructed all of these very comfortable fantasies. But all of that is like kind of falling apart and she doesn't want to listen to the thing inside of her that's telling her to question all that stuff she doesn't she doesn't trust it because there is real danger in like if all those fantasies fall apart what does she have 
because growing up is hard, man. If you get in a relationship with your crush, you could break up. It would be bad, actually. <laughs> um, so that's the two chapters. And sadly, we are over an hour. Yeah. Though presumably we won't be once we edit this because it's like just over an hour. It'll be down to 20 minutes. No, no worries. <laughs> So we we did and did not hit our goal. Not that not that we really care, but not it's just funny how care. much we can talk about a children's book. Um mm. not to imply that children's book I'm you know what I'm saying. Anyways. <laughs> best joke? It's gotta be I'm sorry, it's gotta be the apes in Borneo who are better readers than Kips. <laughs> it's true. Although it would have been great if you somehow could have said that they were like better at detecting ghosts. I do like the joke on Lockwood and Kips at the same time of of their little pissing contest where Kips is all like, if it wasn't for my bullet speed reactions, I've completely disemboweled you. Yeah. And then (laughs) he's all like, Lockwood starts to say all this bullshit about like different reverse moves and stuff. And even even Kips is just like, I don't, what do you even say? I don't even know what you're saying. What's happening? (laughs) It's great. I love how much, how similar yet different they are. Yeah. Almost like they were created specifically to be that way. Right. (laughs) I love when things are things. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't really have a punk rock. Maybe. I mean, it's (laughs) Cat Godwin launching uh, air lanterns into the space. I just thought, though, uh, Skull laughing at everybody at the end is pretty punk rock, actually. It's pretty good. <laughs> like, yeah. you all almost died. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all my fault. I almost killed you. I'll do it again. That's pretty good. I just love Skull. He is a punk. You know what? I'm going to I'm gonna throw this out to our listeners, all five of them. <laughs> um, we are approaching the end of book two here. And I, as I have talked about previously, I believe, refuse to buy copies of books that have irremovable stickers on them. I despise that. Like, whether or not we're mad at Netflix, it, it's the unremovable stickers that anger me. So I've been buying the series in hardback, hardcover, whatever you want to call it, um, because they don't have the stickers. But the third book is only expensive, like ridiculously expensive. Like in Canadian, it's forty seven ninety nine on every website. So if anybody knows somewhere I could get it for an accurate, reasonable price in hardcover, The Hollow Boy, uh, I, I need I need it because we're, we're we're coming up on it. And we got to talk about this book because it's really something. It's a such a good book. I don't so I buy can't the wait for the price to go down. We need to continue to talk well it just like why is it that high there must like they must be nearing the end of the printing or something and not printing any more hardcovers because it's so good it's in demand i don't know i think it's i think it's literally because of the printed on sticker catastrophe like other people doing what i'm doing yeah in the industry it's like oh people who care don't want that and so it makes the price go up in a weird way like i bought the rest of the series for under 20 bucks in hardcover so i don't i don't understand why it's almost 50 again in canadian dollars if americans look it up it's going to be like almost 40 ish anyways it's still yeah it's still a ridiculous price in american dollars it's just different and i have been keeping my eye open whenever i'm in a used bookstore but unfortunately because of netflix these books are kind of popular so they don't I mean, not and, just because of Netflix, they're good books, too. Well, because of our podcast. I mean, oh, right. Yes. The of millions course. of listeners we have. The five of them. Um, <laughs> it's way more than that. I can yeah. see the numbers. It's fine. Uh, so if anybody does have any advice on where I could get a coffee delivered to Canada without insane shipping, let me know. That's it. Okay, so if you want to reach out to us about an answer to my question you can uh follow us on twitter at lockwood podcast or you can follow me specifically on twitter at inferior caitlin you can send us an email about books and where to find them at uh, contact at hollowedgroundmedia.com or you can go to 
our homepage, hologramedia.com, and scroll down to the contact form and fill that out. And remember to always set off your paper lanterns indoors. <laughs>